responsive reading is one that is being heard in churches all over today. The lectionary for today, the ecclesiastical year, today is the fourth Sunday of Easter. And the, the, the psalm that is always used on the fourth Sunday after Easter is the one that we will use right now, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Our first lesson comes from the ninth chapter of Acts. The passage picks up following the conversion of Saul on the Damascus Road. And the aftermath immediately after that uh, amazing thing. Beginning with verse 23, after some time had passed, the Jews plotted to kill Saul But their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night so that they might kill him. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. When he'd come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him, brought him to the apostles, and described for them how on the road he had seen the Lord who had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had spoken boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He spoke and argued with the Hellenists, but they were attempting to kill him. When the believers learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Meanwhile, the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and was built up, living in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It increased in numbers. Now, as Peter went here and there among all the believers, he came down also to the saints living in Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas who had been bedridden for eight years, for he was paralyzed. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and make your bed. And immediately he got up. And all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
pray together. Almighty God, this is indeed a special day. When we can remember our mothers with fondness and smiles, we know that you are good. Like a hen gathering her brood, you call out to each of us, pulling us ever nearer, gathering us into the safety of your wings, bringing us closer to one another so that we may know you and be known to one another. Lord, on this day, we bring you thanks for the good mothers you bring into our lives, whether aunts or grandmothers, friends, colleagues, or cousins. Mothering happens when we are loved by people in the same manner that you have loved us. Help us to remember these mothers of nature and nurture. Remind us of all these who have taught us the lessons of love and life, who have given of themselves and asked for little in return. Help us to remember the mothers who have taught us the lessons of good living, lessons about sharing the gifts we have with those who have little, lessons about our individuality and our need to be together, lessons about courage and hope, joy and sorrow, lessons about when to say yes and when to say no. As we look around us, remind us of those who have not had the opportunity to be nurtured by good mothers. Our world can feel empty to those who have not been loved in a manner that helps them grow. Sometimes our attempts at mothering become smothering, and we help out of our own need to be affirmed rather than our desire to see someone grow. At these times, O God, give us the wisdom we need, loving one another because we have been loved by you, not because We need to feel loved. Help each one of us to be good mothers, male or female, young or old, rich or poor. Through the strength of your spirit, we all have the opportunity to care, the opportunity to love, and the opportunity to bring your peace to the world and to one another. Just as your son loved and valued each one of us, we pray that we might be able to do a bit of the same with one another. Grant each one of us the wisdom not to be perfect, but to be good enough mothers for one another. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, praying the prayer he taught us to pray so many years ago, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson is again this week, more of the rest of the story from Acts chapter 9. Picking up with verse 36. Now in Joppa, there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At that time, she became ill and died. When they'd washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. Since Lydda was near Joppa, The disciples who heard that Peter was there sent two men to him with a request, please come to us without delay. And so Peter got up and went with them, and when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter put all of them outside, and then he knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. And then she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up, and then calling the saints and widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, he stayed in Joppa for some time with Simon, a tanner. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day again to those of you to whom that applies. 
Most certainly, this is a day to celebrate the gifts of all women, even around the globe. After all, we know fabulous women in our lives who've never physically given birth to anyone, but who have been just as maternally influential as anyone ever was. Actually, it was exactly two months ago that the world officially recognized International Women's Day, the uh, 8th of March. The date was commemorated at the United Nations, is designated in many countries as a national holiday, and is rooted in the centuries-old struggle of women to participate in society on an equal footing with men. It has been celebrated since 1911. As most of you know, I grew up and have served most of my ministry in the Presbyterian Church, USA. In my youth, there were no Presbyterian women ministers, although there were rumblings in that direction that had been brewing for some time. In 1891, Louisa L. Woosley published a small book entitled, Shall Women Preach?, She had been ordained a minister of the gospel by the Cumberland Presbyterian Church two years before. That same year, an overture from the Presbytery of East Texas requested that the General Assembly of the Southern Presbyterian Church, the PCUS, pronounce in express and scriptural terms the conviction of our church that women are not permitted to speak in a public way in any meetings of the church, congregation, or devotional where men be present. (laughs) The assembly's response, it is the settled doctrine of our church that women are excluded from licensure and ordination by the plain teaching of the scriptures, and also they are prohibited from speaking by way of exhortation or leading in prayer or discussing any question publicly in the meetings of the church or congregation as a mixed assembly. No women. But as we all know, it was only a matter of time. In 1929, a conference of women was held, And the consensus was that the church could best be served by opening all forms of service to both genders without discrimination, except as to ability and capacity. In order to avoid proposing that all language be removed that's inconsistent with the equality of men and women, the General Council created three resolutions. A, ordaining women both as ministers and elders. B, ordaining women as elders, and C, licensing women to preach. In 1930, the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in the USA passed Resolution B, voting to ordain women as elders. Sarah E. Dixon was ordained in the Presbyterian Church in Wauwatosa, Wisconsin, on June 6, 1930, less than a week after the Assembly had finalized its decision. And according to reports, when it was announced that women could now be leaders spontaneously, every member of the session of that Wauwatosa church expressed his willingness to resign if by his resignation a vacancy could be arranged for Miss Dixon as an elder. She must have been a special lady. The following year, five women served as commissioners to the 143rd General Assembly, which met in Pittsburgh. It would be 1956 before the first woman was ordained as a minister, and now just over a half century later, more than half of our current seminary students are women. When I was in seminary, which was a long time ago, there were four women in the class. That was it. They were very good. They were special. Because, quite frankly, you had to be an exceptional person to want to try and do that if you were a woman. It's not an issue anymore, but it was back then. Truth be told, women have always been uniquely important in the life of the church, whether or not men wanted to admit it or, you know, period. Started with Mary. Women were accorded special status during Jesus' ministry. In fact, it was probably women who were major financial supporters 
of this itinerant rabbi and his friends. Women were the first witnesses to the resurrection. This is not a feminist statement, but a factual statement from the first day to this day. If it were not for women, there would be no church. It's that simple. That simple. Have there been any Im- women important in your Christian experience? Say, I can think of some. My mom, it was at her urging that I knelt down by my bed one night at the age of seven and asked Jesus to be my savior. There was Iris. Iris was our youth leader when I was a teenager. Always there, dependable as the day is long. Uh, There was Christy, my wife, of course. Her love over this past almost half century has taught me what grace is all about. She loves me no matter what. I can't explain it, but then no one can explain grace. There was Naomi in Fort Myers, Florida. A feisty 80-year-old redhead who offered her preacher unfailing encouragement through some very difficult days. Speaking of feisty, I could never forget Mildred in Greensboro, North Carolina, who lived and breathed her church and would have eviscerated anyone who would do it harm. Uh, There was Judy, whose wonderful faith through difficult days had become an inspiration to me. Truth be told, there are so many names I could mention that I should probably just quit now for the fear of leaving too many of them out. But you get the message, I'm sure. Needless to say, no one is really especially startled at such statements these days, but they would have been almost scandalous in New Testament times. Women, women's place in society was not much more than property. And Jesus' willingness to speak to women in public and even include women in his entourage was just a bit outrageous. And so now we're introduced to another woman. A woman role model? Well, right, yeah, a woman role model. She must have been a special lady, this Tabitha, Dorcas. I am not sure if either of those was actually her given name, because both in either Aramaic or Greek uh, meant gazelle. A nickname? Was she swift? I don't know. We have no idea. Perhaps this gazelle moniker applied because she was so quick to respond when someone needed help. Always doing good and helping the poor, says the scripture. Good for her. Role model. A woman. Hmm. And now suddenly, she's gone. And the little congregation of First Church Joppa is devastated. They faced a task that none of them relished. Saints in the church and widows she had befriended on her way made their way to her home. In the custom of the day, they washed her body and laid her in the upper room that was reached by the stairs outside the small house, probably surrounded by bolts of cloth and sewing needles and the thread with which which she had made such loving use, Dorcas lay there in state. The the ceremonial ablutions and anointings complete, the friends stood around her and just wept. A funeral service? course, wait. Word had come that one of the twelve, Peter, was only ten miles away, a preaching mission in the town of Lydda. What could be more fitting for the funeral of such an outstanding lady to have such an outstanding preacher? Two men were dispatched to request his presence, and whether the big fisherman had known of Dorcas before this or not, or was now just learning about her life and ministry, Peter didn't hesitate to respond. He came. This was one funeral any preacher worth his pulpit would be proud to handle. He dropped what he was doing, and he came right away. As was the custom then, and still is today, the preacher was ushered in and found himself among family and friends. 
The lifeless body lay at uh, the periphery, but the center of attention was life, her life. This was a time for remembering. Tear-stained faces would be forced into shy smiles as the memories would flood back. Kind word here, a generous gift there. As the text describes it, all the widows stood around Peter, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. That sharing is therapeutic. You see, those trips that we all take through that valley of dark shadows are made so much more bearable when we share the journey with caring friends. And know this too, preachers are grateful to be included in that sharing. It helps us to personalize our remarks as we prepare for the funeral. I'm certain that Peter was grateful for the sharing, and no doubt he'd been wondering what would be most appropriately said at the service. I doubt that he had too much experience with this sort of event at this point in his life. After all, his background was fishing, not funerals. He was old enough to have attended his share, but attending and officiating are not the same, I will tell you. What to do? Appropriate scripture? Absolutely. The shepherd's psalm that we read together, that's always a favorite. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Green pastures, still waters, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil for you are with me. That's a wonderful word of comfort in the midst of pain and distress. The passage speaking of preparing a table in the presence of enemies would lead perfectly into the theme of Peter's recent preaching, the terrible crucifixion and subsequent miraculous resurrection of Jesus, that could equally lead well into Jesus' promise that Peter had heard with his own ears, because I live, you also will live. Here lay Dorcas, dead now, but still a child of Jesus' promise, new life for her and all who believe. A glorious word of hope, a good funeral, not simply focused on Joppa's loss, but rather on Dorcas's gain. It was getting near time for the service now. Peter needed some quiet moments to finalize his thoughts. The scriptural account says simply that after the friends and family had left, Peter knelt in prayer. Somehow in the midst of that prayer, Peter got the message that there would not be a funeral here today. Instead, there would be something beyond anyone's imagining. Peter, turning toward the dead woman, said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. Woo! Can you imagine what was going on in Peter's mind? Yes, he had seen Jesus do miraculous things, even raise the dead. He had heard Jesus say that these things would also be done by his disciples. And indeed, Peter had been an instrument of miraculous healing. There was the lame man at the temple who had asked for alms, but instead of silver or gold, had received the ability to walk. He had even been hauled before the authorities because of the healing, just as Jesus had been. But he was released with no charges brought. And now this. Wow. No doubt, that was a night of incredible celebration at First Church Joppa. Dorcas' friends felt the exhilaration of Mary and Martha when Lazarus stumbled from the tomb. God granted the widows of this seaside city an experience like the disciples had on Easter morning. Dorcas was alive. What happened to her? We never hear of her again in Scripture. I suspect that she continued her charitable works. Joppa would not ever not need help. For in this seaport lived many families who depended on the sea for their living And those who had faced the ravages of winds and water, especially those widowed and orphaned, had known they could rely on the assistance of Dorcas when needed. And now they could again. Dorcas was alive. 
History records that Joppa was an important city in the spread of Christianity. It was only about 35 miles northwest of Jerusalem, a seaport from which were launched trading vessels to every port in the known world. No doubt the wonderful ministry of Dorcas became the subject of conversation both on shore and in the ships. Her reputation <coughs> became the reputation of her church. No wonder Christianity began to grow. Who would not want to be part of something as special, as loving, as caring as that? A moment ago I said we never hear about Dorcas again in Scripture. That's true. But we do hear more of Dorcas. This wonderful kind lady has been memorialized in countless congregations where we find women's groups, charitable organizations, sewing circles and the like, all named Dorcas. What a tribute. We remember and celebrate the gifts of Dorcas on this day in which we remember and celebrate the gifts of all women. What will you be remembered for? Interesting question. Scary question. One that always brings to mind the story of Alfred Nobel, the one after whom those prestigious annual prizes are named. Nobel made his fortune as a result of an invention of his, dynamite. One morning, he awoke to read in the newspaper his own obituary. You see, his brother had died, but a careless reporter had published the obituary of the wrong Nobel. It described him as the dynamite king, the industrialist who became rich from explosives. It made Alfred Nobel sound like nothing more than a merchant of death. And needless to say, Nobel was more than a little upset by what he saw, not simply that the wrong person was being remembered, but the horrible portrait it painted of him. Alfred Nobel resolved that day to change the course of his life and do something positive for society. He left his entire fortune to be awarded to individuals who have done the most to benefit humanity, and the result was those Nobel Prizes that are awarded with such fanfare every year. For what will you be remembered when you die? For what do you want to be noted as you live in the church? Remember Dorcas. World famous Dorcas. Famous for what? Always doing good and helping the poor, according to the Bible. You too can leave a legacy of Christian love. Go ahead, you have my permission. Be the Dorcas of Hilton Head. Amen. Now, live simply. Love generously. Speak truthfully. Serve faithfully. Pray daily. And leave everything else up to God. And remember, as you go out into the world, you do not go alone. You go with each other, and your God goes with you. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you now and forevermore. Amen. Oh.